Um, a very warm welcome to this uh, seminar on behalf of the UVEMA and Pedestrian uh, Mobility Switzerland. So my name is Patrick Rera. I'm a professor of geography of mobilities uh, at the University of Lausanne, and I am the co-director of the UVEMA uh, with my colleagues, uh, Ben Kaiser. Uh, for those who don't know us, uh, UVEMA is the University Observatory for Cycling and Active Mobilities. Uh, that's an interdisciplinary uh, research center at the University of Lausanne. Uh, Pedestrian Mobility Switzerland, or Mobilité Piétonne, is an NGO uh, whose goal is to make walking uh, safe, attractive, and possible uh, for everyone. And I would like to greet uh, Jenny Leba, uh, project manager at Mobilité Piéton. And this semester, uh, Uvema and Mobilité Piéton are organizing together a seminar series on public spaces. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a presentation of Pontevedra and the way uh, this Spanish city pedestrianized whole areas and gave priorities to active mobilities. And we learned a lot about the political processes behind these changes. If you were unable to attend, um, the PDF and the video are available on the website of the UVEMA. We'll have two more uh, presentations this semester. On April the 27th, we'll have a talk on uh, a project in Biel, Bien, uh, Ile de la Suze, uh, Schussinsel. And in June, on the 4th of June, we'll have two presentations on ongoing processes uh, in, uh, in Switzerland. One will be on Fribourg, Freiburg, and the other one on Yverdon. Uh, please feel free to visit our website to know more about these presentations and to get the Zoom links. Today, uh, we are very happy to welcome James Tom. Uh, who works at Gale. I'm sure that most of you uh, know this, uh, this firm, this company. Gale is an urban strategy and design firm that is based in Copenhagen, but also in San Francisco and New York. James is Canadian. He's a Canadian urban planner, trained in Scandinavia, uh, with extensive experience in sustainable mobility projects. Uh, James has led cycling strategies, both for uh, public and private clients in Canada, the US, Germany, Portugal, Ecuador, and the em Arab Emirates. His work aims to develop the technical and policy solutions required to build more sustainable mobility systems. James lives in Copenhagen with his wife and 16 months old son. And when he's not in the Gale office, you can spot him skateboarding that's another form of active mobilities that we have not addressed yet, but you can see him skate skateboarding uh, in some of the public plazas of Copenhagen, fishing along the harbor front or hanging out in the local park with his family. The title of his talk is Making Space for Cycling, Walking and Staying. But before giving him the floor, some housekeeping stuff. Um, please mute your microphone. Uh, switch off your camera to save a uh, broadband and please use the chat to share your thoughts, ask questions. We'll have time after James' presentation for a discussion and we'll gather uh, all your comments and have a discussion afterwards. So thank you very much, James, for having accepted our invitation, uh, for being with us today and uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you, everybody, for joining in this afternoon. It's, uh, it's great to see so many people taking their lunch hour to, to uh, share ideas and, and, and learnings about uh, making more sustainable mobility systems in cities. If you just give me one second, I'm going to turn on my screen share. You can see my screen now, right? Yes. Yes. Let me go to the slideshow. Yeah. So as, uh, yeah, great. So as um, just some notifications popping up. Um, as Patrick mentioned, my uh, title for today's uh, presentation is "Making Space for Cycling, Walking, and Staying." And uh, I came up with this title a couple months ago when I was invited to participate in this this uh, webinar series. And 
then once I started working on the slideshow, I thought, oh no, maybe I've, <laughs> I've bitten off more than I can chew. Uh, because each one of these things, cycling, walking, and staying, could in their own way be their own dedicated uh, master class or, or, or program or PhD even. So I'm going to do my best for the next 40 minutes or so to go through these topics and how Gail approaches them and, and what needs to be taken into consideration uh, as best I can in this, this short period of time. And then we can, of course, open it up for, for discussion from there. Oops. Oops. So I'm going to start by just introducing Gail uh, as a firm, as a company, what we do, how we approach uh, our work before getting into uh, cycling, looking at the bicycle as a vehicle, walking, understanding the different components that go into walking and how you could say even humans are, are a vehicle, you could say, or what you need to know about humans uh, when talking about walking. Uh, public life, you know, what is, uh, how to foster activity and what public life is and why Gail uh, as a firm is so fascinated by this. And then data, because of course, counting is super important because when it comes to the world of, of transportation and, uh, and, and budgets and politics, you don't really have an argument until you have numbers behind you. So that's something that's really important. It's something that's been at the center of everything that Gail has done uh, for decades now. So as a firm, we are all about making cities for people, uh, specifically cities that are equitable, healthy, and sustainable. And that ranges in scale from, you know, we've worked with uh, Nuuk, the capital of Greenland, with uh, about 40,000 residents, uh, to Shanghai with tens of millions of residents. So we've, we've tackled a lot of different contexts and perspectives and challenges in these different cities that we've worked in but always with this idea and this approach of making the, the cityscapes more uh, human scale. We are not a conventional architecture firm. We are very multidisciplinary. So we have, um, um, we have architects, we have landscape architects, we have planners, but we also have uh, anthropologists, economists, um, data scientists, uh, programmers, full stack developers to sort of tackle a lot of these challenges. Um, not only in cities, but within the market itself from different angles. So it's, it's a really fun place to work with. And I think we, uh, we do get some really exciting results by taking this multidisciplinary approach to, to our projects. And of course, the, the firm all started with, uh, with Jan Gale, the uh, architect and academic from, from Copenhagen. Uh, who started his career as a, you could say, a, a very, a very good modernist architect, uh, until he met his wife, who asked him. She's a psychologist. Asked him, "Why don't architects care about people?" And with that sort of question, sort of planted a seed in his mind of sort of revisiting what architecture was at this period and how it could, how it can better uh, accommodate uh, people, the the end users, right? So he, with that guiding thought. He wrote two books, two main books uh, initially in the 70s and 80s, which is Life Between Buildings and Cities for People. And the, the learnings and the ideas that, that came from these books and came from this research have really been a springboard for, for Jan's career, but also for starting the company uh, in, just over 20 years ago. Uh, in the last 20 some odd years, we have uh, worked all over the world, like I said, from Nuuk to Shanghai and everywhere in between. We have offices here in Copenhagen, uh, also in New York and San Francisco to work a lot more and be more engaged and present in the North American market as well. And everything that we do sort of, like I said, we're a bit of an unconventional planning and architecture firm uh, really starts with this idea of public life and sort of understanding life first, and then creating around that, creating spaces that, that foster life and make a public life, uh, uh, allow it to grow and allow it to thrive, and then the buildings around that. So we're really all about, like, like Jan's book title, the life between buildings and how we can work that into, uh, into our work and into our, our projects. But of course, you can't really talk about public life and mobility, or you can't really talk about public life without addressing streets. Because when you look at the sort of the footprint of, of our urban spaces, of our cities, 80% of all the open spaces are the streets. Parks make up a little sliver, the rest are streets. And these are very dynamic and complex uh, spaces that have endless stakeholders, um, but have so much potential when they're done right. 
And speaking of uh, stakeholders, this is a, an issue we often encounter, uh, whether we're working in, in uh, yeah, uh, China or Chile, um, it's sort of this, this siloed approach to, to urban planning and, and urban city management, where there's different departments that have uh, that are responsible for different little pieces of the streetscape. So you have the mobility department, the traffic department, the parks department may have uh, some ownership, some say, the development department, the zoning departments influencing the buildings, and they're all taking their sort of their own siloed approach to their job. And sometimes they miss the bigger picture of the potential of what streets can really offer cities when done right. So that's something that we always uh, fight for, always argue for, and always try and build into our processes is getting sort of this sort of holistic experience, this holistic approach to uh, city development and uh, city discussions by having all departments present, but also like hearing from one another and, and understanding the different perspectives. Because when you do that, when you break down these silos, then you're able to get a much healthier uh, and sort of better performing at the end of the day, better performing uh, result. So I'm going to go through the uh, the topics. First off is the bicycle. Um, like uh, was said in the introduction, my focus for, for the past 10 years, professionally and personally, has been about the bicycle and making cities more bicycle friendly. And when I talk about bicycle friendly cities, I'm talking about the bicycle as a as a mode of transportation. This is not some some recreational thing for kids to play in the park or middle aged men in Lycra to go up uh, uh, in the countryside on the weekend. Those things are fine. They're great. But for me, what's interesting is the bicycle as a form of transportation to travel through uh, and within the cities. I also have to say I'm not a cyclist. Um, I do own a bike, just one. Um, I don't, uh, I hardly know how to, to change a tire or a tube or anything like that. Um, I mean, even there, I said tire, you, you actually, you change the tube and not the tire, right? Um, but despite the fact I'm, I'm not a cyclist, I still manage to cycle about 40 kilometers a week. And that is strictly because I live in a city where cycling is an everyday easy choice that's facilitated through infrastructure that makes it a convenient and safe um, mobility option. So with my background, actually, uh, my education in urban geography, one of the most resound, or resi um, one of the, the strongest arguments for, uh, for cycling, from my perspective, is this, the sheer uh, spatial efficiency of how, much, how many people you can move uh, through, through space when you have cycling as a mode of transportation. So this is a, this is a scene from Copenhagen. This is uh, part of my, my afternoon commute home. And you can see in this, Two probably two and a half meter wide bike lane there on the right. On the right, you have just in this image fourteen people. In those uh, three three and a half three meter wide uh, car lanes to the left, you have sixteen vehicles. And this is a very this is just like an everyday snapshot of of the scene on the street. Uh, and it just really sort of drives home the sort of the efficiency from a spatial perspective. Uh, never mind all the other arguments uh, from a spatial perspective of moving people by bike and facilitating them by giving them their own dedicated infrastructure. Of course, public transportation is also a super important part of the discussion around mobility. Uh, and it's also very practical for, for moving people as well. And when we talk about cycling in the city, we need to understand that cyclists have different, uh, I like to say, speeds, needs, and deeds. So you need to understands that cyclists will be traveling uh, at very different speeds. Some people are going fast, late for work. Some people are going slow at a comfortable pace with their children, perhaps. And that means that you need to build infrastructure that allows people to pass, to pass one another and to be passed at a safe and comfortable pace. Then they have different needs. Some people need a wider infrastructure if they have a cargo bike, for instance, or, um, for, for work or transporting their children or uh, they also have different deeds. So some people, uh, you, can, you need to think of the bicycle as, as not just um, something for individuals to get to work and back, but also a solution for, for companies and uh, uh, the public sector as well to, to um, tackle challenges and, and, and duties and jobs within the city. And that's something that actually is really exciting for me. I think this is like the, the forefront of the, the cycling uh, world right now, the urban cycling world is cargo bikes. Uh, you see them everywhere in Copenhagen, 20, 
uh, yeah, just over 25% of all families here have a cargo bike to get their kids to and from school. But then you also see uh, the, the hospital network. They use cargo bikes to transport blood and tissue samples from hospital to hospital. Uh, you also see people celebrating a, a bridal party uh, by a cargo bike and, and staff, you know, cleaning parts of the city by cargo bike. And uh, on the right here, uh, this construction worker is actually checking the water levels uh, just adjacent to a, a construction site. So you can see actually how cargo bikes can fill many roles uh, if and when uh, people feel safe choosing the bicycle. And it's important to consider that when we're talking about the bicycle as a mode of transportation, the bicycles are simply fast moving pedestrians. And if you just sort of, with that, uh, just flip of the switch, remove the bikes, it's quite easy to see how, uh, how bikes really are very close to pedestrians. And in that way, there's sort of pros and cons for being fast moving pedestrians. Uh, a con, a negative is uh, a disadvantage is that they are quite vulnerable in traffic. Uh, especially with uh, uh, with cars uh, traveling right next to them at high speeds, but then another pro is that they um, they bring a, a human element to uh, to streetscapes. You know, when you're seeing dozens, if not hundreds, of faces pass by you on bikes, it does something to the street. Uh, it creates a different um, atmosphere in the street that can uh, that uh, just can't be achieved with uh, with cars. But Keeping this in mind, the bicycles are, are fast moving pedestrians. You also need to then realize that uh, with those, with the vulnerabilities that come with that, they also need their own dedicated space. You know, it's one thing to, to tell a cyclist to, to share the lane, to, to yeah, share the lane with cars, um, but you wouldn't ask pedestrians to do that, right? It, except for very specific situations, in pedestrian streets, but you wouldn't ask pedestrians to walk down the middle of the high street with the cars and just share the lane because that's that's just uh, unsafe and, and foolish right so that's something to keep in mind with with uh, cycling as well that they need their dedicated space to feel comfortable and to actually be safe and when it comes to safety there's a it all comes down to infrastructure uh, you can't actually be safe cycling until you have the infrastructure that makes you safe um, in, in Denmark, there's really just four types of infrastructure, four typologies that really respond to the, the surrounding context. And those five, four typologies are presented here. So the first one is actually the, the shared street. I know I just said you can't share the street, but in certain situations you can. And that's when cars are driving less than 30 kilometers per hour and there's less than 2000 cars per day. So it's a very low traffic street with very low speeds. But remember, it's not enough just to put up a sign that says 30 kilometers per hour. You also need to design the street in a way that physically makes car drivers say, oh, no, I have to. OK, I got to pay attention. And they slow down passively without even maybe considering it. Uh, it has to the design. Of the street actually has to um, uh, ensure people are driving at that speed, because all too often you could have a sign that says 30 kilometers per hour. But the design of the road says something else says 50, 60 plus kilometers per hour. The second typology here uh, is the, the painted lane. This is uh, in sort of quieter, but a little bit faster streets in Copenhagen. Um, we ha don't have so much car traffic, but they are traveling around 50, 40 kilometers per hour. In this situation, the, the city will do what's called parking protected lanes. So here, as you can see, you have cars parallel parking here. So what that does is brings a sort of a, it makes the, the parked cars be a buffer between the bike lane and the moving traffic. Um, this works in Copenhagen. I know other cities around the world have tried this, but people, it's just hard to change driver's behavior and they end up still parking like in both situations. So they'll park against the curb, but then also in this parking lane and that just works for no one. So I know, um, in many cities, when they've done an approach like this, they'll also add in bullards or little um, sort of uh, modular curbs to make sure that the cars follow this arrangement. The third typology in Copenhagen or in Denmark is the, the grade separated lane. Uh, and this is sort of the standard throughout the city. It makes up most of the network of cycling infrastructure in Copenhagen. And that's where you have uh, the car lanes here. Then you have a curb cut up to the bike lane. 
to the, the cycle track, and then another curb up to the, the pedestrian path. And what's brilliant about this design here is that it's super legible, it's super intuitive, it's easy to understand what's happening here. So when you enter the street, whether you're a car driver or a cyclist or a pedestrian, you know exactly where you belong. Uh, you don't have to sort of pull out a user manual and put up signage to say bikes here between this time and that time or anything like that. It's just very straightforward, easy design. Then the fourth typology is when cars are going uh, much faster and there's much higher traffic. And this is when you really need to physically separate the modes with both horizontal and vertical buffers. So these four typologies actually make up 98% of the, uh, the cycling infrastructure that, that, that follows uh, the road network in Denmark. So it's just a very sort of simplified approach to, to planning for, for cycling in, in, all con in all contexts. Oops. So that's uh, along the sections, but then at intersections, there's also some, some small things that can make, uh, make the intersection safer. Uh, Danish design does not go as, uh, is not as, um, what's the word, as, as, as physical or as, uh, uh, yeah, as physical as, as Dutch intersection design. Uh, there's lots to be learned from Dutch intersections, certainly. Um, but I like Danish intersections as a good starting point for making safer cycling cities. There's, they're more sort of easier to digest for the traffic engineers in, in Texas or in, in Switzerland or in, or in uh, Australia, right? It's something a bit more understandable and you could then maybe use that as a stepping stone to do the real sort of super safe cycling infrastructure uh, intersections that the, the Dutch cities follow. But there's a few things here they can go a long way for making intersections safer. I'm sure many of them are familiar with you. Dedicated signals, uh, cycle crossings, cycle crossings uh, painted in a, a bright color through the intersection, uh, banisters for uh, making the weight a little bit more comfortable, and then so-called bicycle boxes um, to get the cyclists up front um, and visible. And actually in their own way, all of these things uh, are about making cyclists more visible and about making the behavior more predictable. So it's safer for all road users. So I could dive into each one for, for a while, but I'll just take one very briefly. Maybe this one here, the, the, the bicycle banister, the bicycle railing. So this is sort of a very cute and fun thing that Copenhagen has done. I guess shared online sometimes where at the stop line at a red light, there's this little railing where cyclists can hold on as this gentleman is doing, maybe even put their foot up on that footrest. And then it just makes the weight for the green light that much more comfortable. So that's, that's nice, that's cute, right? It, it accommodates maybe one, maybe two cyclists. Um, and it shows them that the city is thinking about them. But at first glance, that's about it. It's, it's just really a cute thing. But what I love about these is there's actually a whole sort of second level, second layer of the, the role or of how this makes an intersection safer. So when you have something like this that makes somebody more comfortable, that also makes them more patient, which means that they're less likely to run through a red light uh, if, it's, if they're getting tired of waiting, which means then also the people behind them are gonna be more patient and more respectful of the rules. So it's a way of nudging behavior um, through treating people uh, with respect and, and recognizing them. Uh, Copenhagen is also, uh, if you've been here, you've sort of maybe seen uh, many new pedestrian and bicycle bridges and the city has been on a building spree over the last 20 years, I'm sorry, yeah, 20 years, 16 years of building these new bridges. Uh, they go, there's a lot of sort of beautiful, sexy bridges like these ones over the harbor and over the, the, the beautiful little canals, but then there's also very practical bridges that go over motorways and, and rail yards and whatnot. And they've been very instrumental in stitching the city together from a cycling and walking perspective, but also getting people onto the bikes. So this is, uh, for example, like this bridge here, it's difficult to understand from this image, but to the left, this whole neighborhood doesn't have access to the regional train line. But then with this bridge, now tens of thousands of people have much quicker, more convenient access to a, uh, a regional train station. So that's cycling. I, I usually do my cycling talk in, uh, in an hour or two, um, but I gotta 
Uh, I got a couple of topics to tackle today. Um, so then there's walking, of course, which is uh, something that's very dear to the audience here, and of course dear to to Gail as a as a as a practice. Um, and there's, of course, you can say there's there's more to walking than walking. You know, it's not as simple and uh, easy as it seems. Um, but there, you can sort of reduce it down to some metrics and some some concepts that make walking uh, practical and safe and convenient. So one thing we like to say is you need density. You need clustering of um, of uh, people. Simply, you need a lot of people living uh, rather dense with, uh, yeah, living and working in, in a dense environment. It, it really helps the attractiveness of walking combined with diversity. So it's not just diversity of land uses and people. That's super important. Different people of different backgrounds, ages. It all goes into making a healthy city, uh, but also the different um, uh, land uses. So whether you ha are having space for people to live, but also spaces for people to shop, whether they're going to a restaurant or a cafe or a shoemaker or a uh, locksmith or candy store, what have you. Uh, all these different uh, land uses help uh, feed into making a more walkable, uh, friendly city. The image on the left is actually one of uh, our favorite case studies. This is this is a city or a neighborhood in, in, in Malmo, Sweden, just across the, the bridge from us here in Copenhagen. And this has been a, yeah, a really fascinating and successful case study. If you have the chance to visit, I really recommend it. It's called Bo01, which means uh, Bo in Danish and Swedish means uh, to live um, so or like a, a habitat. Uh, and it was built in, in 2001 um, at the turn of the millennium, which is really cool because a lot of these neighborhoods in 2001 have not really aged brilliantly, but I think this one has really, has really, you know, it, it, it you can tell it's of a certain era, but it is still just as of an, an attractive place to live and walk and play and all these things as it was, as it ever was. And what you can see here is there's sort of a diversity here in, in facades, in colors, in designs, in uh, scales of streets. You know, they open up to bigger um, blocks or bigger uh, um, courtyards or, or plazas or little squares, bigger squares, smaller squares. Uh, they, they have narrow passageways, you have wider passageways, but you just really have this diversity that keeps people stimulated as they walk. And that's something to keep in mind. Um, that we as humans, as pedestrians, are rather slow, very slow modes of transportation, and very slow, rather slow creatures, animals, ourselves, right? So the average walking speed is more or less five kilometers per hour. And that speed has sort of, for hundreds of years, our cities have sort of adapted to that or sort of built around that, um, that, that speed, traveling at that speed. So when you're walking in a, in a neighborhood like the, the Lower East Side in New York there, you are getting this sort of visual stimulus every four seconds. So as you're walking, you're, you're looking at different things, looking at different windows, looking at people, shopkeepers, um, trees, whatever is on the streetscape, and you're sort of being stimulated and you're just traveling along at a nice pace and the sort of the landscape suits your pace. But then when you encounter a, a passive facade that doesn't have such stimulation, I know all of us probably have, have sort of experienced this and felt the difference that when you're walking in uh, a denser urban environment is definitely a different feel than when you're walking along a very passive facade, whether it's a wall or a fence or a, a modernist era uh, industrial park, there just isn't that stimulation. Um, and then your brain starts to turn to other thoughts saying, oh, it's really hot. Oh, it's really cold. Oh, it's really stinky here or what, whatever. Then that's when walking starts to become not as a pleasant experience. And then in turn, not as a, an attractive experience. One of the tools we've developed uh, over the years is uh, this walkability tool that we uh, uh, work with. Uh, we sort of apply when we evaluate the the walkability of a neighborhood or a city. And we look at these different fa factors, you know, whether people are, whether there's proximity between different uses, uh, whether there's a network that connects people where they wanna go, uh, how safe people are is really important, but equally important is how safe people feel. So both the absolute safety and the perception of safety, 
uh, how comfortable people are as they're moving through the space. Can they do different things uh, throughout the day? Um, and then the, the different environmental qualities that really speak to the space, whether it's uh, pleasantly shaded from the, from the climate or protected from the wind and whatnot, um, or if it uh, really speaks to the, the local identity of the city. And that leads us to public life, uh, which is sort of the, the third topic for this discussion. And public life, of course, if you read anything by, uh, by Jan Gale or um, sort of followed our company, you know that this is sort of like the bread and butter of our work and what sort of drives, creating public space is what drives so much of our, uh, of our, uh, our work as a firm. And public space is a really sort of fluid, nebulous uh, definition, or has a very fluid definition or nebulous definition that can encounter and encapsulate so many different things. It can be like public life can be this the civic uh, scene where you have people out protesting something, uh, protesting for for improvements or a better life. But it can also be the very mundane stuff, like just going to the grocery store uh, or the market to to do your your weekly, your daily shopping. It can be very planned and organized and structured and sponsored and uh, secure events like a, like a concert or a, uh, an open air uh, movie screening, but then they can also be these very spontaneous things. My colleagues always use this slide. I have to roll my eyes. I'm originally from Toronto where this is taken. Uh, I'm Canadian from Toronto. This is taken on King Street in Toronto. And, uh, uh, it's just too cliche of a scene to see these guys <laughs> playing hockey uh, on the street. But at the same time, I know it does happen. So uh, it, is a, it is a good uh, um, showcase of this spontaneous public life. Oops. Uh, and it's public life is also the things that we love to do. We love to be with our friends and family out, feel, uh, feel the sunshine in their face and get some fresh air. We like to see and be seen by others, but then it's public life is also the stuff that we just have to do no matter what. So we got to commute to work. We got to walk to work. We got to bike to work. We got to bring our kids to the local daycare, whether it's raining or snowing or windy and whatever, we just have to do it at the end of the day. And that too feeds into the definition of public life. And what's interesting to see is how public life has it, it changes uh, over the eras, right? So depending how our, uh, it changes in response to our economies and uh, our, uh, uh, our society. So look at a hundred years ago, you see that public life is really about what people have to do. So if you look at these old beautiful paintings of, of urban scenes, those are always my favorite in, the, in art galleries. You see just people going about their day, uh, uh, selling things on the street, transporting things uh, and whatnot. Um, this is sort of, that's the, the sort of older version of public life. It's uh, still very relevant, but it, it, it has become less and less visible. Uh, and then into, the, into the, the current era or current cities, public life is really about these, these optional activities. Uh, and then when you make space, for people to be out in the streets and enjoy themselves, feel the sun, feel the wind in their hair uh, by creating the space, creating the infrastructure, what have you, then you can, you can, uh, you see, we have seen the rise in these optional activities and therefore the sort of resurgence of public life in, uh, in many cities around the world. Copenhagen has been one of those cities that has gone through this, this journey. Um, starting in the 60s, uh, uh, and actually, Jan Gale and Gale Architects along later have actually been involved in a lot of this. And Copenhagen has really been sort of an urban laboratory for, for, um, um, for the firm and for Jan uh, for over half a century now. So it started, the journey in Copenhagen started with uh, the pedestrianizing, pedestrianizing, pedestrianizing of Stroll, uh, a uh, sort of high street that cuts to the, the old medieval city. Um, but has gone sort of step-by-step -step piecemeal approach through the decades to sort of build up a whole network of um, pedestrian spaces and plazas uh, that have really created a city that is very, very nice to be in, very nice to live in, very nice to invest in, uh, and just uh, very healthy and uh, very cliche, but a very happy city uh, that has resulted from that. So that's, it's, 
I know Copenhagen can seem like the sort of fairy tale of a, of a city with tons of public spaces for some audiences, but it's important to remember that this has been a journey, that this wasn't built in a day, that it was sort of a long-term effort uh, through serious governments and through serious, um, sorry, through consecutive governments and, and serious discussion over the decades to get to where we're at today. But this transformation wouldn't have really been possible without uh, understanding how important data is. Because like I said at the beginning of this, this slide, uh, that when you're talking about investments and uh, political arguments and all these discussions, you don't really have an argument until you have data. Um, and data is something that the, the, you could say the car industry or the, the world of automobiles has always been very keen on. We've always known sort of metrics like uh, the level of service of an intersection uh, of how many cars an intersection moves uh, per hour. But it's also important to think about how we can get, gather that data in terms of public life and walking and cycling as well, and how that can be used to, to, uh, to, to shape investments. So for us, our approach has sort of been rooted in observational data collection, uh, looking at people moving, but also people staying and looking at how they're moving um, and how, how they feel when they move, what, the, what sort of modes they're moving along uh, and for people staying, how they're staying, who's staying, how they behave when they're staying uh, have also been very uh, sort of indicative for us for, for healthy spaces. So we started with these, these observations, our public space and public life methodologies that, that study all these things and give us uh, data that we can then go back to clients and, uh, and, and governments and policymakers and say, this is what you need to do to, to boost the attractiveness and the safety and the health and everything of your city. Um, but then we've also been taking this whole traditional observational approach to a whole new generation. Uh, like I said, we have data scientists, we have app developers here in-house. So we've been able to develop our, our own sort of Gale lens methodology that, that layers all these things, that layers uh, observations, that layer uh, social, democratic, uh, social demographic data, online surveys, uh, observations through apps and whatnot to give us a, a really sort of deep understanding of a context and uh, develop work from there. So the apps have actually been very useful uh, during the, the last couple of years in the, during the pandemic, because all of a sudden we couldn't be there in person to, uh, to do the counts and to do the, uh, the observations, but we now had this tool where our clients could just download the app and we could do a training session virtually and then have them go out and collect the data, whether it's students or staff or volunteers, and then feed that data back to us and back to the, the, the client so we can then start to develop um, strategies from there. And this sort of data, yeah, this data approach has been really important for us for through all of our work in fostering public life and uh, uh, human scale sustainable mobility for, for a while now. I mean, since, since we started. Um, and one of the sort of main flagship projects we did that re relied on these observational studies was the transformation of Times Square in New York. So when we first started working with the, the Bloomberg administration in, in New York City and the uh, Department of Transportation, we looked at Times Square and many other squares along Broadway. And we counted and we said, you know what, you have this, this square, but 80% of the space is dedicated to, to cars and, and vehicles, motorized vehicles. 20% of the space is dedicated towards pedestrians. But the other side of that, then you have 80% of the people moving through are moving through by foot. 20% of the people moving through are moving through on cars. So there's an obvious disconnect here. So it was just like this very simple story that we got out from this, these, this observational data that we were able to make recommendations on how to improve. So they started with this, this pilot project uh, for the first year, for the first summer, very cheap, very cheerful, very easy to implement. Uh, and then we were able to collect uh, data again to see how that has improved or how that has facilitated this 80%. And then, uh, then what we've also seen when we create spaces like this, people stay. And when people stay, that means more advertising dollars for these uh, billboards up here that Times Square is famous for. It means more traffic. It means more um, for, the, for the storefronts and the, the kiosks on the ground level. And it makes Times Square even more Times Square, right? It brings the square back to Times Square. 
Um, we've also taken our learnings to, to private developers. Actually, this is a uh, this is what a, some shopping malls in Florida look like. So they still sort of try and it's this new urbanist approach where they still have the streets going through these shopping districts, but a lot of the tenants here you'll see are very familiar shopping mall tenants like The Gap and H&M and whatnot. But we worked with the, the, the property owner there to sort of reinvigorate that space and redefine what the street can be and sort of maybe through building out wider sidewalks and slowing down traffic through traffic calming, maybe then this can become more of a destination rather than sort of a glorified shopping mall. And this, so this was a rendering we produced and this was actually the result. Uh, and this, this uh, investor was actually very fortunate that this was finished just before the pandemic. Uh, so this, this shopping area all of a sudden became a destination during the pandemic because people could still be outside and have fresh air and uh, not worry too much about uh, the spread of the virus, but still uh, be out in, in public. So it was actually very strategic for them. Here's another example of a project we've done um, in, uh, in Buenos Aires on a very strategic level where we worked with uh, the mayor of Buenos Aires at the time to really uh, improve the, the condition of some of the, uh, the informal housing settlements where before it was sort of, uh, there wasn't really access to or the municipality to sort of had turned their back to it. And now they started to embrace it. And actually the mayor set up an office within this, this settlement and uh, started to show that they're really invested in improving the, the situation in public life there. And then one other project we've, uh, I'll share today, which is the city of Riga in Latvia. We developed a mobility vision with the city um, where we sort of created a lot more public space um, for, uh, for people that are arriving. This is the main central, the main station creating space of this sort of like welcoming uh, concourse when you're coming into to Riga for the first time or on your daily commute, but then still having space for mobility, but of course, prioritizing these more sustainable modes. So thank you. I just uh, wanna say as a concluding remark that these, these concepts of walkability, bikeability, uh, public space and, and uh, public life, they're, we're not talking about them for their own sake. It's not cycling for cycling's sake. It's not walking for walking's sake. It's all about doing these things as sort of a piece of the puzzle for making a more healthy, more attractive, more, uh, more robust, sustainable and resilient city. So thank you for your attention today. And I look forward to uh, turning it over to uh, discussion for the next uh, 15 minutes. Thanks. Thank you very much, James. Thank you for your presentation.